Okay, and uh, we're talking about a very timely uh, topic of AI. It, one of the uh, audience members today told me that their daughter went to do an interview in Canberra, and the in interview was done entirely by a machine. So there's no other human on that side. It was just done by an AI. I just, it's just crazy to think about that, you know, you're going to walk into a room. So if you're a student, the chances are very high. that you're going to, you know, to get a job, you're going to walk into a room and uh, be interviewed by an AI at some point in your life. So that's really something to think about. And it really uh, is important to understand what the hell AI is and what uh, it can do and what it cannot do. So i um, really glad you can join us uh, for this lecture. So uh, I want to start with the um, acknowledgement of the country. See if that works. So um, the, uh, I was in a lecture by Professor Megan Davis, who is Pro Vice Chancellor of UNSW and one of the most amazing people I've met in Australia. So she's an indigenous constitu constitutional lawyer and one of the authors of the statement, Uluru Statement from the Heart, which is awaiting to be adopted by the parliament for the past 10 years. Um, so, and she had a really interesting uh, remark to make. It really made an impression on me. And she was saying, so with, with NIDAC week coming up, um, you see this word reconciliation a lot. And she was saying that reconciliation is for two people or cultures who were friends. And, you know, then something happened. And, you know, maybe they weren't friends for a little while. And then, you know, we need to bring them together, right? But she was pointing out that the two cultures here, uh, the, settlement, the settler culture and the indigenous culture, actually never met. And she was inviting everyone to, as a first step to just meet. And I just found that, you know, that's just such an amazing um, invitation. And it's so much fun because like in my experience, so I was down in um, driving down on M1 towards past Gold Coast. Has anyone drive down there and seen this big avocado? You guys know what I'm talking about? How many people know what I'm talking about? Yeah, a few people. So there's this massive avocado, it's called the Exotic Fruit Farm. And they have these indigenous uh, tours um, well, it's not an indigenous tour, it's a tour of the fruit farm, but the guy giving the tour was the indigenous person. And he was teaching us all about the languages of the, of the local tribes around that area. So he, he knew a lot. And he was talking about how, like, in many of the tribes, like hundreds of different tribes and languages, there's no words for goodbye. It's like, because nothing has that finality. You, um, you never, you know, it's always see you later. Isn't that amazing? It's like um, many of these cultures, many, many of them don't have a word for ownership um, because that concept was not important, didn't really exist. You used things when you needed them and then other people used them. And I just found it really playful and fascinating to be, um, to be learning about this and meeting the culture this way and, and much lighter than, you know, heavy things about reconciliation and, um, sort of that sometimes comes up, uh, which is important, but also this step of meeting is also very important. So I hope uh, you all get a chance also uh, to take advantage of the opportunities to come up. So for me, it's always a learning process. Um, and I was very blessed to have that experience. Okay, so uh, just before we move on, uh, there is a, um, uh, a QR code for you. So this QR code is uh, for um, uh, anyone who wants to ask a question, please, uh, um, you get on this website and you just enter your question. And I, as the moderator, try to read out your questions or choose the ones um, that I can, you know, I apologize in advance, most likely I won't be getting into all the questions. So, um, but uh, if somebody cannot get to that, we've put uh, around the, around the hall there, you can use the QR code uh, to get into the site for questions. Okay, any questions? All right, so uh, uh, today's lecturer is uh, Professor Jordi Williamson, 
from University of Sydney. And um, Jordi is a, a product of Australia. Uh, he grew up in the country uh, near Sydney, a couple of hours near Sydney. And uh, he uh, got his bachelor's at University of Sydney and then did PhD um, in Germany. And we met actually in Germany while we were doing both doing postdocs in Bonn. So we've been friends for um, now, uh, yeah, nearly 15 years, something like that, or 13, 14 years. And it's been a real privilege uh, to see him rise to the height of mathematics. And I just, I mean, you can, you know, look at the Wikipedia site and like see all the list of honors, et cetera. So I don't want to just repeat what's uh, easily available online, but I just want to give you a sense of uh, sort of personal um, observations um, about Jordi and how he thinks about math. And I think the best way, uh, to, so there's various ways you can think about math. You can think of it as science, you know, really hardcore. And great scientists use math, Newton, Einstein, Kepler, you know, uh, Galileo. And, you know, so that's one aspect of math. And then there are more subtle aspects of math because math also has this artistic side. And uh, so when you think about artists like uh, Picasso or Mozart, so, but the, dif the difference is that um, it's a bit harder for general public to appreciate the beauty of mathematicians. Whereas we, when we practice maths, for us, it has the same satisfaction as uh, listening to Mozart. So that's another way that maths enters our lives. But a third way, I think that's sort of more relevant for tonight is that just think about the most complicated game that you can think, you know, whether it's chess or any sort of a game, you know, and math is infinitely more complicated than that, okay? Because it's a game that the entire nature is playing. And we're sort of observing that and trying to figure out the rules, okay? But the amazing thing about Jordi is that he, he plays. You know, it's not about like this serious, you know, I'm a mathematician, got to prove things, blah, blah, blah. It's all about playing. And he's completely open to things going not the way he expected. Uh, or rather, I should say that he sort of starts maybe with no expectations. There is this um, Chinese Zen proverb that says, if you seek the truth, you should have no preferences for it. Because if you have a preference, then you see what you want to see, not what is the truth. And this is sort of what I've observed uh, about Jordi, is that in his playfulness, He's also extremely, so has this element of rascality. So, you know, like, uh, so there's this famous conjecture, for instance, in math called the Hodge conjecture, which a lot of people have gone crazy over trying to prove this conjecture. And it's been sort of, it's conjecture means something that we think is true, but we don't know how to establish it. And Jordi, um, you know, is the only person I've met in mathematical world who's come up to me and said, wouldn't it be wonderful if this was false, you know? It's sort of like, you know, it's everybody just, you know, prays and hopes it's true because all of our notions of what is true are going to break down if this is false, or many of them would. But he's sort of completely open uh, and maybe even searching uh, for, uh, for showing that it's false, okay? So, um, so that's really refreshing, and I think that's, his, uh, that's the secret to success, okay? So um, we're very glad to have him... Um, tonight to introduce us to some of his games. Please, Jordi. So thank you very much, Masood. So what I'm talking about today is a simple question, which is, can neural nets solve difficult problems? So neural nets are part of deep learning and machine learning. And we came up with the concept of neural nets in the 1950s and 1960s. And in the last 20 years, they've been incredibly successful at solving tasks like image recognition, speech recognition. And these are tasks that humans generally find easy. 
So we can look around this room, we can perceive where we are, we can see the lights, we can see each other. It's effortless. And this is something that computers have really struggled to do. So when, when I was a teenager, I actually tried to program a little, a little program that recognizes cartoons and what they're doing, and I abjectly failed. It's a really hard problem. Uh, but this is something that uh, neural nets excel at. And one of the interesting things about this is that we don't actually tell the computer what to do. So typically in computer programming, you tell very precisely what the computer should do. In, when you're doing machine learning, you're telling the computer how to learn what to do. So I said before that we're asking, can these techniques solve difficult problems. And the reason that I'm interested in this is because typically these methods excel on easy problems. And maths problems are kind of the polar opposite of that. So often in maths problems, we're thinking about problems that people have been thinking about for decades and sometimes even centuries. So they're the polar opposite of the kind of easy questions which typically machine learning excels at. So this will be towards the end of the talk, but before we get to that, I want to explain to some extent what a neural net is, how it works, and what it can and cannot do. So I want you to look at the following picture. So I'd like you to memorize all these numbers later on. So if you stare at this, matrix it looks like a scene from the matrix now it's pretty meaningless you might notice that all the numbers are between 0 and 255 and so what we could do is use them to encode a grayscale value so white is 0 and black is 255 and if we do that we get the following picture and now we still don't really see anything but if we zoom out we do so this is a beautiful picture of a tiger. And notice how effortlessly you're able to pick up its whiskers, the eyes, the stripes. You know, it's totally effortless. And yet, if I were to display all those numbers that are involved in this picture, which is actually what the, what the computer stores, I would need a board about 10,000 times as big as this, and it would just be covered in that matrix of numbers that we just saw, okay? So this is something, you know, how many images do you look at, did you look at today? You know? So there's 10 million pixels in this image alone, and yet you're effortlessly able to pick up what's in this image. It's absolutely extraordinary. So our visual capacity is absolutely amazing. And I hope that it also convinces you that it might not be so easy for a computer to look at this and say, Tiger. Yeah, that's the difficulty in image recognition. Okay. So how does our brain actually do this? We don't really know. But we can ask neuroscientists, and I just want to give you a very brief picture of our understanding of the brain. And I should preface this by saying that I'm really not a neuroscientist. Uh, you know, I have colleagues that I can talk to about this stuff, which is fascinating. So our brain is made up of neurons, and here's an excerpt from a beautiful work by Santiago Ramón y Cajal, who was one of the first neuroscientists. He was the first person that witnessed a neuron in the brain. So before Cajal, people believed that our, our neural structure were these strings and that our brain was kind of a big ball of string. And what um, Cajal explained is that there's individual neurons. And so this is a picture. So when Cajal was, um, was a kid, he wanted to be an artist, and his dad forbade him from being an artist, and he became a neuroscientist. And, but he was always fascinated in art, and he did the most incredibly beautiful drawings. And they still inspire us today, these drawings. So you can see here's um, a, a picture of a slice of, um, of the brain. And you can see all these neurons linked up in these very complicated patterns. And here's another picture that he did. Oh, sorry. This is, um, yeah, this is trying to illustrate in a very approximate way what happens in the brain. So we get a whole lot of signals from our sensory apparatus. So these are small electrical signals. And then they enter a neuron. 
And I just want to get across the following simple structure, which is that a certain amount of charge accumulates at the source of a neuron. And then for a while, nothing happens. And then when a, when a certain action potential is reached, the neuron fires. And exactly what happens is very complicated. Okay? But that basic picture that nothing happens and then something happens is very important. So here's another picture of Santiago Ramon y Cajal. I think this is now a cat, the brain of a cat. So when we look at this and we're a mathematician or we're a computer scientist, we might ask ourselves, can we imitate this on a computer? And different neurons fire in different ways and there's an enormous amount of complexity, but researchers in the 50s thought, let's imitate this in the most simple-minded way that we can. So this is the, the perceptron. So this is a formula. So I'm allowed about three formulas in this talk. So what happens here is what we're, what we're indicating is that there's a certain amount of input. So in this particular case, there's three inputs. They're summed up. And then we take the max of zero and this sum. So this means that if this number is negative, the output of this thing is zero, i.e. nothing happens. And if the output is positive, then we take that output. So this is just trying to crudely imitate this fact about neurons that we observe, that nothing happens and then something happens. Okay. Simple. Okay, so this is, the, this is the output curve. So on, on the x-axis is the input, and then the y-axis is the output. And when we look at neurons, um, different neurons have different effects on other neurons. Okay. So we imitate this in, by using weights. So what that means is that in this graph down here, we can either adjust kind of on the x-axis when the neuron starts firing, and we can adjust, adjust the steepness of the firing. So these are the weights. So actually someone wrote me an email that said that this graph is not at all the function that I, that I illustrated in the formula, which is true, okay? Yeah. I haven't totally forgotten how to graph a function, but I'm just trying to give you this, this, um, this intuition that um, nothing happens and then at some point something kicks in and we can adjust when something kicks in and we can adjust the rate at which it kicks in. These are, this is what we fiddle with when we're fiddling with the weights. Okay. And we just put these together. That's, that's an artificial neural net. So we take the most simple-minded model of a neuron that we could imagine and we put them together and this forms an artificial neural net. So here's a picture which illustrates the training of a very simple neural net. So on the right-hand side, this is the, so the, the dots, the blue dots, and the orange dots are the data. Okay, so this is what is given to the system. This does not change. This is kind of like observed reality. So we as humans look at this picture. Oops, I didn't mean to start it yet. We, we look at this and think, oh, there's a blue cluster in the middle and there's this orange ring around it. And what we want to do is have the neural net pick that up. And what we're, we're training is the shading. So you notice the blue and orange shading. This is indicating where the neural net thinks the orange points are and where the neural net thinks the blue points are. Okay, so at the moment, it's very bad. Yeah, it's getting basically half wrong, half right. Now, you, now, here you watch a neural net training. So what you will see is what the neural net thinks are the um, orange and blue points starts getting accurate. Okay. Okay. Now, now it's essentially getting it 100% right. It's totally identified this blue cluster, and around it, it's got the orange cluster. I'll show you the same again. And what I want you to notice is that the result will be slightly different. So every time we train a neural net, the result will be slightly different. And also, I want you to look in the middle. So these lines are indicating the weights of the, of the, um, of the neurons. So these are these numbers that I was indicating before. So what we're doing is giving more or less uh, emphasis to different inputs. OK, so you can see that the blue line on the top becomes quite dominant. And some, some neurons, for example, the one in the bottom, the bottom left, um, aren't activated very much at all. 
So here you can see it one more time. Okay, this took a little bit longer to train. And now we can watch it training on a more complicated data set. So we can see on the right hand side, it's very clear what's going on. There's this blue spiral and this orange spiral. And here you can watch it training. So you can see up in the top right, there's a, there's a test loss and a training loss. And you can notice that there's these big periods where it's not really um, improving that much. And then you'll notice that it has aspects that look a little bit like our kind of human experience with learning. So suddenly you'll notice improvements. So I'm not sure. Yeah, now there's a sudden improvement. Yeah, the test loss has suddenly dropped. And it's, you'll see in the diagram that it's picked up something about the data set. And then I think soon you'll see it um, get worse. Yeah, which also, I don't know if, you, if you've had that experience when you're learning a skill and then you feel like suddenly you're a lot worse than yesterday. And that also seems a necessary part of learning. Um, and you can see it struggling, struggling. Yeah, see, then it just suddenly got worse and then got better. Okay. So this is a fascinating um, little website. And I'll include the link at the end if you want to play with this more. It's very, very nice to visually see these neural nets training. Okay. So what, just to summarize, what we're doing is we are, um, we have these weights on the neurons, so how much each, each um, artificial neuron can influence another neuron. And then we just kind of fiddle these weights and see if they get better, if the output is better or not. And we do this fiddling a lot. Um, and if you actually want to know how this fiddling works, it's basic calculus that we teach in first and second year uni. So it's very fundamental maths goes into training. Uh, and yeah, you can train away. Okay. So I just want to emphasize that an artificial neural net is just a very crude picture of a brain. Um, and that one can think about this a little bit analogously to, you know, we didn't fly by perfectly imitating birds. You know, planes look very dissimilar to birds. And there's a lot of discussion in the neuroscience community, what aspects of neurons are actually uh, fundamental to intelligence. Like, is, are these very complicated firing patterns part of intelligence, or are they something like a feather, which is a beautiful thing, which has evolved, um, but may not be essential, for example, for flight? Okay. So this is a, just a brief timeline of the development of machine learning. So uh, the, the perceptron was this first artificial um, neuron, was in 1958. And there were various various phases of hype and then AI winters that followed. And in the 90s, there were major technical advances, but it still took kind of 20 years to reach industrial strength technology. And now, in over the last 12 years or so, it's very, very widespread. Um, it's used in, you know, you probably used models like this a few times today, perhaps without realizing it. So it's right throughout, um, right throughout our world nowadays. So this is using neural nets on simple problems, basically. So it's using problems on using neural nets on problems like image recognition um, and speech recognition and things like this. Tasks that we find easy and computers find difficult. But the first time that one saw neural nets really doing well on an incredibly difficult problem was in 2016 in the game of Go. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the game of Go, but it's the oldest um, continuously played board game in the world. Um, it's incredibly complicated. So if you think about chess, which you know I think is a pretty complicated game, the number of board positions in chess is about the number of atoms on Earth. And the number of board positions in Go is about the number of, it's, sorry, it vastly exceeds the number of atoms in the observed universe, in the known universe. It's just orders of magnitude uh, more complicated than chess. And I had a good friend um, when I was doing a PhD who was one of the best Go players in Europe, and he was nothing compared to 
the East Asian Go players, but he was still very good. And, um, and he was telling me in about 2010, 2012, that computers will not play professional level Go for the next 20 years or so. And in 2016, you had this tremendous breakthrough, which was uh, basically a neural net um, playing Go. So there was this famous match between Lee Sedol and, uh, and a DeepMind um, neural net. So this was written by an AI lab in London called DeepMind. And there were several remarkable aspects about this game. So it was a five game series and um, AlphaGo, the program, won four games to one. And there's a beautiful documentary about this match, which you can watch for free on YouTube. And so Lee Sedol, when he wins, I think he wins the fourth game. And it's really like a redemption for humanity in some sense. So and still, still win. And for me, the most remarkable thing about this match was happened in the second game, which is this move, um, this famous move 37. So I think it's the black stone kind of halfway up the board is this move 37. So this was a move that the computer played which was really shocking to Go players. So it very much went against conventional wisdom about how to play Go. So conventional wisdom said you should not play this game, and several commentators thought that it was a mistake. And you can see Lee Sedol, it's really beautiful to watch his expression, the expression on his face when this move is played, and you see this kind of mix of shock, and this is very weird. And then he leaves, and he goes outside and he smokes a cigarette and thinks for about 15 minutes and he comes back and plays what I think is a very strong move. But um, basically, he lost, so he lost this match. He lost this game too. And this game, uh, this one move was really decisive in showing that this program was not just playing at a very high level. It was playing differently, differently to the way that conventional humans we're playing. So you could think that this, this program has just gotten very good at imitating humans, but no, it's actually playing an interesting new move. So in a press conference afterwards, Lisa Dodd said, yesterday I was surprised, today I am speechless. So the CEO of DeepMind is a guy called Demis Hassabis, who in 2018, partly um, due to his work on AlphaGo, was elected to the Royal Society which is a very old scientific society based in London. So its members include, uh, its fellows include Newton and Darwin. And if you're elected, you get to sign the fellows book. So this is a big book and it has the signatures of everyone who's been elected to the Royal Society. And here you can see the signature of Isaac Newton. And you can also see that below, People have pointed to Isaac Newton's signature so much that they've almost rubbed out the poor fellow below. And in 2018, I was also elected. So here are the Antipodean um, fellows elected in 2018. So you'll see um, third from the left is Michelle Simmons, who was former Australian of the year. And you'll also see Elon Musk, who was um, elected that same year. And he would come. So there's three days, and it's the most inspiring scientific event. All the fellows present a 10 minute talk on what they've done, and there's incredibly interesting discussions. And Elon would turn up every morning in his Tesla driven by a bodyguard and park out the front. And uh, at the induction ceremony, so it was one of the most inspiring events of my, um, my kind of intellectual life. And I was really interested in talking to Demis Hassabis about the possibility of potentially playing a move 37 in mathematics. And it was very fortunate because everybody wanted to talk to Elon Musk. Okay. So you had this like scrum of people around Elon Musk. It was impossible to talk to Elon Musk. And then Demis and I could quite happily chat. Um, and we had some really fantastic discussions about the, what we could potentially work on. Um, he had some ideas and I had some ideas. And then we, can, we continued correspondence, and this led to a collaboration between mathematicians and uh, the DeepMind team. So in the last few minutes, I just want to describe in very vague outline uh, what we worked on. So we worked on two different projects. So one in my field, which is representation theory, and another 
in not theory, and I'll just discuss the, the work in representation theory. So one of the uh, kind of key things in my field are Kajdan-Lutzig polynomials. So if you don't know what a polynomial is, here's an example. That's a polynomial. And just think about it as a packet of numbers. So if you, if you know what a polynomial is, great. And we're teaching a course about, um, about these things this week. But you can just think about it as one, three, one, just a packet of numbers. And I like to think about Kajdan-Lutzig polynomials as kind of atomic numbers of mathematical structure. So if someone comes up to you and says, I have the periodic table, here are all the elements, then that's somewhat useful, but it's much more useful if they can explain to you how these elements can combine, what their atomic number is, what their mass is, that kind of thing. So there's these fundamental objects in mathematics called representations, and Kajdan-Lutzig polynomials give us um, information about these representations. A little bit like atomic number. Uh, so here's some animations which show the kind of complexity and development of Kajdan-Lutzig polynomials. So you can see the, all these polynomials slowly growing, and, and they're very beautiful things. And there's a lot of complexity in them that we don't yet understand. Um, and here's another slide. Here I've taken these polynomials and I've just added up the numbers. So. And you see this incredibly beautiful pattern. So you can think about this as an enormous molecule, and this is giving all the structural information of the molecule, if you want. These incredibly beautiful patterns. And there's much about these polynomials that we don't understand. And it's also very easy to generate enormous numbers of them. So they're very, um, they're very um, appropriate for um, investigation by, by machine learning. So what I proposed to Demis that we work on is this combinatorial invariance conjecture. So I won't go into much detail about this. Basically, we can start with a pair of permutations, whatever that is, that's the input data. And then we have this very deep measurement of that pair of permutations, which is this Kajdan-Lutzig polynomial, this packet of numbers. But there's something much more elementary that we can associate to this. It's kind of, it's both elementary, but also incredibly complicated, which is a Bruja graph. And the conjecture predicts that there's a way to go from this complicated graph structure to the polynomial. That somehow out of this complicated graph thing, you can distill polynomial. So I think it's really good to think about the kind of, the complicated structure as being like the image of the tiger and the Kajdan-Lutzig polynomial as being like the judgment, this is a tiger or something like that. It's a high level judgment that we make about something. And I remember when I was proposing this, I was actually literally thinking, what would, what, would my, what would my mind be like if I'd lived in a world in which my evolutionary history was dominated by Bruja intervals and these complicated graphs rather than tigers or something? Yeah? Would I be able to instantly recognize Kajdan-Lutzig polynomials if that was my experience, if that was what I'd trained myself on? Yeah? I think it's a really interesting... It's a kind of fascinating idea. Like machine learning gives us this visual capacity in situations where our visual capacity has no experiential base. So here's the summary of what we did. So we train graph neural nets on this problem. And models achieved high accuracy extremely quickly, kind of shockingly quickly for me. I was not, not used to this field at all. And we were able to get an insight on the problem coming from the model. So the computer was kind of, the model was pointing us in some direction. And for many months, I had no idea about how to interpret this direction. So in the not theory work, um, Mark Lackamy and Andras Juhasz were able to use very similar techniques to deduce a new, um, a new uh, relationship between um, invariance in not theory and discover a new theorem in knot theory, relating two different fields of knot theory. And our results were published in Nature just before Christmas last year. Okay. So I just want to give you some kind of picture of, of what we did. So on the left is this complicated thing, and I'm trying to distill a polynomial out of it, a packet of numbers. And what the uh, machine learning model told us is that certain edges are important. And I had no idea why. And this led to a conjecture, uh, 
And so this is a conjecture that we still cannot prove, but we've checked it in many, many cases that it, it would solve this conjecture in a very important, it would solve this old problem in a very important case. But somehow if I show this formula to experts, the right-hand bit, the plus sigma on the right-hand side, makes total sense to us experts. This is very expected. Whereas the left bit in the middle is very mysterious. And this is what kind of came out of the model. So it was kind of like, it's very much like a human computer collaboration. Both terms are important. Um, one comes from our expert understanding of the subject and the other comes out of the model. So neural nets were able to give us clues, but we need mathematicians to decipher the clues. We're nowhere near mathematicians becoming obsolete. And the insights gained from the neural net were fundamentally different from what an expert would consider when looking at this problem. I really think like to think about intelligence as being a space. You know, we know intelligence is not an IQ value, but intelligence is a space. And I really feel that these models were kind of giving us access to a different access, access in the space. And that's why I find this so interesting and exciting. And I'm very excited for the future of this work. I think it has a lot of interesting potential. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jory, for this uh, inspiring talk. So um, we're going to have a question and answer session right now. So uh, we're going to have uh, Jordi and we're going to have a, another special person joining Jordi in the discussions. So um, that's uh, Anna Pushkash. Uh, and Anna is a lecturer in mathematics at UQ. She's um, originally uh, from Hungary, which um, small country in Europe and somehow remarkable for producing sort of amazing mathematic, mathematics and amazing mathematicians, uh, besides water polo players, I heard. They're also good at water polo. And uh, um, so in particular, one of the, so they, they're known to be extremely playful mathematicians, Hungarians. So one of the, one of the most famous ones, um, uh, Paul Erdős. So this fellow, he didn't have a home and all his belongings, uh, would fit in just a small briefcase that he was walking around with. And he would just literally go from this city to another city, go to a mathematician's house, um, just stay there for a few days, you know, learn some mathematics, write a paper together, and then just you know, take his briefcase, go to another mathematician's house, different city, different continent. You know. And uh, he would, uh, there's a story about him that many times that he would wake up in the morning and he would drink coffee. He was drinking coffee constantly. There's a famous quote by him that the mathematician is a machine that makes uh, coffee into theorems. Uh, but uh, he would drink his coffee and get in the mood. And then he'd be like, OK, he would say to his host, OK, my mind is open. Just an invitation to play, you know, without any preconception, whatever you want to play, he was up to, up to the game. So very much emphasizing the playfulness nature of mathematics. So Anna comes from uh, that tradition and uh, she did her undergrad there and then went to uh, Columbia University, one of the elite universities in America, in New York, and then a postdoc um, in uh, Japan and also in Canada. And then finally, uh, she joined us here in uh, UQ and we hired her, of course, because of all the amazing work that she had done during her PhD and following her PhD, publishing in top journals. But um, I think over the past couple of years, um, it's just been amazing to watch not just her doing mathematics, but also what she brings into table in terms of interactions with students. Um, any of you that has taught anything or remembers their teachers, or if you have kids and uh, you, know, you see the interactions of teachers with kids, you, you realize that it's um, not at all a transaction where I pay you and so to teach, you know, multiplication table to my kid. It's much, much deeper and holistic. And uh, I learned a lot over the past couple of years from Anna about how to look at students holistically and how to develop that in emotional intelligence to see that, uh, that human uh, in front of us. And that was really, um, I really appreciated that. And so Anna is going to uh, join us 
for the discussion. Uh, please have a seat. And uh, I will be um, uh, looking at the questions um, that you will send. Uh, so maybe I will go back just in case somebody didn't um, didn't uh, put in the. Uh, um, I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, has anyone asked questions yet? No. Okay. Well, ah, I see something. So that's good. I'll just go back to the uh, beginning so that uh, anybody needs to put that in. Okay. But Anna, you can start, and I will. Uh, Thank you very much, and thank you very much for, for telling us about all this. Well, now that I know that you can ask an AI to ask several questions, I'll try to ask at least good questions compared to AI, but maybe I can't. Anyway. Um, is it not on? Is it not on? Yes. Good? Okay. Maybe thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so perhaps you can... Tell us more about the experience of working with the uh, DeepMind team and how you communicated with with the AI, because it must have been very new and the and the thing that perhaps you haven't experienced before. Yeah, absolutely. It was very interesting because you know I began work with these AI researchers, and it took a very long time. For, so the, firstly, there's the issue of like communicating with the researchers, and then there's the issue of like communicating with the machine learning system. So firstly, we have to communicate with the researchers, and um, and it was very interesting because you know I had no background in AI, no, no background in machine learning whatsoever, and they also had no background in mathematics. So and I think it took a very long time for for them to understand what mathematicians actually find interesting and what we what we seek to do. So. Um, I think that people don't really understand that we don't actually care about like getting a reliable answer. Um, we much more care about the why. And so at some point we had this, um, this model that was doing very well. And they said, it's actually interesting to be running around the halls of deep mind saying, if anybody can explain what this model is onto, then we get a paper. And it was like, oh, we have to explain a model. That's interesting. We haven't tried to do that before. Um, so that was a very interesting experience. The, the, the question about how do you actually interact with a, with a model is much harder. So one of the things that I've definitely learned in this whole process is that this is not a black box. It's not something that you just kind of, it's often presented as neural nets or something that you just feed them anything and they spit out um, some kind of learned knowledge about the situation. But we were using very specific architectures and, um, and people that work with these architectures all the time. Uh, and so a lot of our kind of communication with the, with the models occurs through, for example, choice of architectures and really technical engineering uh, decisions. So you, <clears throat> so you have to make some specific de decisions about how to train uh, the neural net to, to give you some information about cardinalistic polynomials, for example. But so how do you... How does the how does the neural net communicate insight? So how do you interpret the information that it gives you and turn it into or interpret it as mathematical insight? Yeah. So I guess the first the short answer to that is with extreme difficulty. Uh, so I think it's very common. Um, we certainly had this situation about five times where you have a model that's just getting the answer right all the time, and you cannot, for the devil of you, work out how it's getting the answer. But the, I guess the interesting thing in this work is that we did use a very basic saliency analysis uh, to derive our results. So the way that you can think about this, for example, in image recognition is imagine that you have a model that's very good at deciding if there's a tiger or not. So now you can ask, can we reverse engineer the model to decide where the tiger is in the image? And one way you can do that is by just kind of like blocking out parts of the image and saying, do you still think it's a tiger? And that's a very kind of crude way of working out where the tiger is. Um, and basically, this is the technique that we use. It's not, quite, it's not quite as crude as that, but it's almost as crude as that. And I should say that actually in image recognition um, problems, that kind of attribution technique appears to work very, very poorly. Um, and so the DeepMind people were very surprised when this like very crude attribution technique actually gave us interesting um, mathematical 
mathematical predictions. Thank you. So yeah, there's been a few questions. So uh, one question is that, uh, do you consider or read about risks of powerful AI and how do we balance um, sort of uh, the power, uh, you know, the risks with the insights? Yeah, if the question is really about like, should we be scared that AI is gonna take over the world? Um, then my feeling is I've seen no evidence that we're anywhere near this. Like a lot of the time, the models are extremely stupid. They're very much um, designed to do what they're designed to do. Like, you know, if if kind of human level intelligence is over here, then we're like some tiny little, you know, we can do things like recognize images or something. And um, yeah, I personally am not kept up awake at night um, thinking that the AIs are gonna take over the world. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if the question was more than that, but. Yeah. yeah, I think you can interpret it as, yeah. Um. So <clears throat> have you, you mentioned that you originally started talking about how how can you encounter move 37 in, in maths? Have you, like, have you seen the analog of something quite as surprising as that? No, definitely not. I think that um, something like that move 37 is really like, you know, a watershed event in, the history of go play uh, but i do think that we're seeing some hint of it like that that plot that i said at the end that i showed at the end of the of the saliency analysis so this is saying that in this very complicated graph certain parts of the graph are more important than others this was a very very surprising um prediction from my point of view you know i've thought about this problem for ever since i was a phd student and uh yeah, so it's it's a small step, but it definitely seems to me like some something was pointed out to me that I never would have found on my own. Um, what do you think it would take? Like, for example, are you using the full computational power of DeepMind, for example, for your interactions? About yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. So what kind of resources are we using? And in this particular case, it's not big resources. So all of the models that we train, we could have done so on a laptop. The um, not theory work used a, you know, a few computers, but nothing like the you know, crazy server banks that, um, that DeepMind has access to. Um, and a lot of these problems are not really about computational power. It's more about finding the right, the right architecture to run the right approach to the problem. Um, I can imagine in the future, there might be mass problems that are really helped by massive architectures but yeah we we haven't found one yet so uh there's a question that are these sort of what are special kind of problems that lend themselves to ai and is it like are they like hard to find or is it like somehow everywhere and we just have to put on different kind of glasses yeah that's a super good question so what mass problems can you attack or what problems in general can you attack with these techniques uh, so my feeling is that it there's probably like 20 or 30 like questions that I consider absolutely fundamental in my field. And these techniques would work on one or two of them. Um, so it's definitely not a kind of golden bullet to solve many problems. So one of the things that you need is access to enormous amounts of data. Um, so I used to joke before I kind of became involved in this that, so you know the way we talk about big data, I feel like my subject is really about little data. So you have like extremely few examples that you can actually compute and you have to somehow, you know, make a guess based on like four data points or something, which is like the absolute polar opposite of what, um, what machine learning is good at. But I definitely think there's a lot of problems out there in the mathematical landscape that, that machine learning could, could potentially be gainfully used on. Yeah. So with, with any tool, any new tool that one learns in almost any area of science or just life, it, it kind of influences where one goes with one's questions. Do you think that will happen in mathematics? Like, do you think it will kind of, what questions can be um, understood using an AI will, will sort of influence the direction of mathematical discovery? Yeah, I think that's fascinating. So for example, with the invention of the computer, that's really changed mathematics like the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture, which is one of the most important unsolved problems in number theory, was the result of a very, very early computer computation. And that really shifted, it became a paradigm in number theory. 
and I definitely think that paradigms will emerge um, thanks to thanks to machine learning. Uh, I'm not sure what they'll be. Uh, and I also think it's it's lovely. Like I think that the effect that computers have had on mathematics is wonderful, and I think that this will be similar. So there is a question about um, you mentioned that the computers pointed you towards a certain, um, you know, um, yes. Or mm -hmm. how did that actually happen? Like how does that pointing, you know, how does that communication actually happen? Like what's the? Yeah. Uh, so that's a great question. So. I mean, very concretely, so you have this enormous graph and you're trying to make a prediction based on it. And you have, this graph is just impossible to imagine beyond small examples. So a very complicated thing. So think about it like a crazy Tokyo sub, subway diagram or something. Like it's a crazy subway map and you wanna find certain stations in this subway map or something like that. Um, and what the, what the saliency says is it points out certain vertices in this graph that are important that the model thinks are important. And sometimes this will just be a consequence of the way that you've trained your model or something like that. But um, in this particular case, the, the thing that we found was very robust across different models, um, different training regimes, et cetera. And so it seems to be pointing to something that's intrinsic in the problem. But there's also the danger that it's not, and it's a total red herring. And I actually spent a few months thinking that, you know, now it's just, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't know what it's doing. It, I'm just going to keep thinking about it my way. Um, yeah. And it's very hard to trust, trust these systems because they're very random. Each, you know, each time they provide a slightly different answer, et cetera. So you've got a, it's a very diff, different way of thinking to the way that we mathematicians traditionally operate. So you've said that there's many elements of, of, the, of the work of a mathematician um, that, that isn't currently taken over by uh, AI. Is there an aspect of it that you would like it to intrude upon or sort of either like are there other parts beyond sort of I mean there's a very specific kind of intuition that you have gotten from mm -hmm. AI. Is there a different one you would like it to give you? That, so that's another fascinating question. I guess I would the thing that I find the most fascinating about this whole process is it it forces you to ask, like, what questions do mathematicians ask? How do we work? How do we gain insight? And one of the ways that we gain insight, I find, is some kind of aesthetic formal sense. So Masood mentioned the Hodge conjecture before. And I think the Hodge conjecture is a good example of something for which we have extremely little evidence. We, like, I think that basically no cases of the Hodge conjecture are known, essentially. But somehow it makes a lot of formal sense. It's a very beautiful statement. It would be lovely if it was so. Um, and I think that, gu that guidance of mathematical inquiry is fascinating. Um, and that's something upon which um, machine learning gives absolutely no insight at this point. Um, and I think it would be, I, I, I have no idea how machine learning could help on that kind of formal aesthetic aspect of maths but i think it would be interesting in separating like is it really true that it cannot do that and that would be interesting because that would be some part of um intelligence which it has no access to so um there's a question of um essentially um these pointers that you get from machine learning the results are they able to quantify an error term or like their um is that something that you know, we can expect? That's a really good question. Like, a, you know, bars or whatever, error bars or whatever. Uh, yeah, I honestly haven't. I mean, it's so, it's so error prone that I guess my like base assumption is it's wrong. And then if, it, if it's consistent over a number of different retrainings and a number of different models, then there might be something to it. So yeah, that's probably a question for people that that employ machine learning much more in kind of physical applications. So yeah, there I probably shouldn't say something stupid. So was there any was there any part of the of the experience of working with AI that you found um, difficult, either in a way that was enjoyably difficult or or something that was just genuinely tough? 
Yeah, I mean, one thing that's like very tough is these this model getting extremely high accuracy within three days. <laughs> I was like, stop you model. Like I've been thinking about this problem for 15 years and you can get it like it was getting like, I don't know, within three days it got like nearly 98% accuracy. And then um, and then one of the guys at DeepMind kind of fiddled with something. And then at some point it got 99.8% accuracy. And I was just like, oh my God, like, and it's kind of motivating in a, like a kind of an ego shock kind of way. Like, oh, I want to be good at something too. So I'm going to try and, um, so that was definitely difficult. Um, also, like, I guess it's psychologically difficult, this thing of like, you know, it's intimidating to, to be talking to these absolute experts in this incredibly fascinating subject with access to extremely high powered computers. Um, also, I would say that it's definitely like, this is truly interdisciplinary work. And interdisciplinary work is really hard. It's really hard to find a common base of communication and often there's misunderstandings. That's definitely a challenge. So there's been a couple of questions about um, model training uh -huh. and like how important is you know, actually the training and also like, can we sort of um, make it so that no further training is required so that they can you know, train themselves? sort of a thing. Um, yeah, so I guess one thing that's uh, incredibly important in this whole business is that there's various choices that you make during training. Like you, 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 tra you, you, you choose like a training rate, for example, which is how much you wiggle your parameters at, at each point. And these like little innocent choices can lead to a model training very well or extremely poorly. <laughs> Um, and these are like basic engineering choices. And I kind of think, oh, you know, it doesn't really matter. But that can really matter because it can totally mess up everything if you do it wrong. Um, and the other thing is like when to stop. And so we, we saw that example of in the spiral where it gets reasonable and then there's this long plateau. And then suddenly you have this improvement again. And um, it's kind of shocking that you, you have these. So I don't know if you... you You've seen these um, DALI 2 and GPT-3 and these very large language models. So they have these kind of experiences where you have very, very long plateaus of training where typically we would give up. And then after three months or something, they suddenly improve and get, get massively better. And so my understanding is that the kind of question of where to cease training is totally, we don't really know. And also it's disconcerting that you can wait for months and then it can suddenly improve. Um, so this is all heuristics. And for that, you really need experts that are working with these models every day. So you've, you've mentioned in the demonstration that there are a couple of things where when you watch a neural net train that, that you can kind of identify as, as something that happens in, in one's own learning process. Was there anything where what you've learned about neural nets and how they train has has really shaped either your understanding of of how you you understand something or maybe your appreciation for different parts of insight that you might have that's a really beautiful question and i think there actually has been something um which is this simple so I, there's this quote that i heard once and i don't know who it's from but it's it's a physicist i think and they say every day i try to be a little bit less wrong and I think it's a very powerful, so working with these um, neural nets, I think it's a very powerful idea that you just have something and you want to be better. You don't want to be totally correct, but you just want to be better. And I think that's a very powerful idea that is quite foreign to pure mathematicians. We, we're used to kind of proof and right and wrong, but being a little bit better is sometimes powerful too. Um, so I think um, we have um, time for uh, one more question. I will just um, mention it from the list, but then uh, we can continue. Uh, we have another half an hour of uh, uh, that we can have a drink and uh, canapes outside. So I invite you all to come out. So the last question is um, about um, possibilities of demarcating, so to speak, aesthetic intelligence versus machine learning intelligence. Is that something that um, yeah, how should we think about that? Or how are people thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, that was, the, that was what I was trying to get at earlier. 
Um, it's just a, it's just a possibility, and I think it's a very interesting possibility. Like, imagine that we have in ten years' time we have models that are able to explore large parts of the mathematical landscape. Are they able to, you know, do they get stuck at certain points? Um, are they more easily able to explore certain structures? And does that reflect some kind of abilities that we have? Um, I think is a fascinating, fascinating question for the future. You know? And how much of our aesthetic sense is just pattern recognition? Um, you know, it, it could just be some kind of very sophisticated pattern recognition that leads us to the Hodge conjecture. Somehow, I don't think so, but it may be. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a fascinating journey. Well, thank you very much, Jordi, and thank you, Anna, and thank you, everyone, for being part of this journey.